Okay, so welcome to my second attempt at trying to record RNA biosynthesis and splicing. Um, we've already gone over DNA replication, we are on to transcription, and going to be soon on to RNA translation. Um, okay, so there's two major things we're going to be covering today. It's going to be RNA biosynthesis, which is transcription, and we'll also be covering the additional complexities in eukaryotic cells, which is the separation of transcription translation in time and space, uh, transcription factors, multiple RNA polymerase enzymes, and extensive RNA processing and splicing. So all that and more. Uh, stay tuned. <laughs> okay, so a quick overview of RNA synthesis. Um, RNA polymerase 1, uh, first things first, RNA polymerase searches for sites or DNA sequences where transcription start signal occur called promoters. Then two short stretches of double-stranded DNA is unwound to produce single-stranded DNA templates. Three, the RNA polymerase catalyzes additional addition of correct ribonucleoside triphosphates by a phosphodiester bond. Four, synthesis continues in one direction. And five is the termination. Signals indicate where transcription ends. Okay, so the initiation of transcription at promoters, or, or one. Uh, specific DNA sequences called promoters indicate the start site for transcription. One common promoter site is the TATA -ta box, which is T-A-T-A, TATA. -ta. Okay, and the efficiency of promoter sites dictates speed and frequency of RNA biosynthesis. So this is the consensus sequence. Uh, the closer that the region is to the consensus sequence, the, it determines the speed of the transcription, essentially. Okay, so then two, RNA polymerase partly unwinds the DNA to separate the strand, uh, so it's unwound around 17 base pairs or so. Okay, so then, oh, sorry, I'm clicking off the source of things. The, then we see the addition of new nucleotides by RNA polymerase, and it is very similar to DNA polymerase reaction in regards to how it works. You still see sort of the hand structure there. Um, it's going to have the, the similarities include that it's a nucleophilic attack of 3' hydroxyl on the first phosphate uh, to form the phosphodiester bond. It's supported by two metal ions, which you see there and there. It occurs from 5' to 3' direction. It is energetically favorable. It's uh, driven by cleavage of phosphate, and it has uh, proofreading ability some. And there is no primer needed for RNA polymerase. Sorry about that. Okay, and four, the replication continues in the transcription bubble only on one strand in only one direction. Only on one strand in only one direction. So you see there, you start getting the movement of it there on your template strand, which is this here, coding strand. It's unwound, it's rewound, and it moves in this direction, five prime, three prime. Okay, so the termination occurs at specific RNA sequences that form specific structures. The termination sequences are often uh, sort of a palindromic CG region that form a stem loop, which you see here, structure, which is often followed by a poly U sequence, which is U, 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 a whole bunch of U's at the end. So CG, 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 and the U, the stem loop with the U, U at the end. Okay, so that's a basic uh, RNA biosynthesis understanding. So now let's get into the additional complexities that you'll see in eukaryotic cells. Okay, so in eukaryotes only, uh, eukaryotic transcription and translation are separated in time and space. So transcription, uh, primary transcripts are made in the nucleus. They are modifications of primary transcript, which is your processing here. And then they are exp exported to the cytosol to perform function. So mature RNA uh, is created in the nucleus and then transported out. A polysome is more than one ribosome reading mRNA while polymerase is occurring. Can occur in prokaryotes and eukaryotic cells. Um, prokarya uh, prokaryotes can make different proteins while eukaryotes can only make one type. Uh, transcription in the nucleus, translation in the cytosol, as represented here. Okay, so additionally, again, in eukaryotes only, the transcription complex includes many additional proteins called transcription factors. Um, individuals can speed up or slow down, individual proteins can speed up or slow down transcription. 
Uh, this leads to very precise control of gene expression. So I can see here this, this uh, particular region of transcription requires the additional proteins like B, F, and the RNA polymerase 2 and the E protein in order for that particular sequence to be initiated. Okay, still eukaryotes only. Uh, eukaryotic RNA polymerase differs from prokaryotic RNA polymerase. Uh, eukaryotic have several different RNA polymerase enzymes 1, 2, and 3 which make different RNA products. So the RNA polymerase 1 makes most of the rRNA synthesis. RNA polymerase 2 makes mRNA and sRNA, RNA, sNRNA. And 3, uh, RNA polymerase 3 makes tRNA and 5S RNA, rRNA. So the activity of some eukaryotic RNA polymerase, uh, RNA polymerase 2 is controlled by phosphorylation on serine residues of an extra C terminal domain. Uh, different RNA polymerases are affected differently by inhibitors or toxins. Uh, example, uh, alpha amanitin, which creates death caps or toxin that can shut down RNA polymerase. Okay, um, additionally, still in eukaryotes only, there's extensive RNA processing. Um, you see the S here, that's S is a Svedberg unit, it's based on size. It's not really important for what we're talking about, but it's on there so you know that it's there. Okay, so ribosomal RNA processing. The nucleotide modification of bases in ribose by small nuclear, uh, nucleolar ribonucleoproteins, uh, so SNRPs, as SNRPs, SNRPs. Uh, cleavage, and then it is cleaved into different rRNAs, so it's taken out, splicing, sploom, brought together, pushed together into mature rRNAs. Okay, and there's quite a lot of processing that occurs in tRNAs um, in eukaryotes still. Um, now do note that the prokaryotes do some processing. Okay, so tRNA processing, transfer RNA processing. There's a removal of a leader sequence, which is this part, which is capped off in pro and eukaryotes. There's removals of intron sequences, which you see here. That's taken out, you don't see it over there. Um, exchange of the terminal sequence for this, and then the alteration of several bases, which is kind of hard to demonstrate just on here. Um, so just of note there, the exchange, uh, all mature RNA sequences have a CCA tail at the end, on the hydroxyl end. Um, and then the splicing, just of note, does occur in the anticodon region down there in the loop. Okay, so the extensive mRNA processing in eukaryotes, uh, messenger RNA processing, um, involves the addition of the 5' prime cap and the cleavage of the 3' prime end and the addition of the poly A tail. So what you see is the cleavage signal, so it receives its 5' prime cap, receives a cleavage signal as a point at which it needs to be ended, the nascent rRNA, uh, nascent RNA is uh, cleaved by the specific endonuclease, uh, ATP is applied in phosphorylation, um, so did, uh, which causes the addition of the poly A polymerase tail. So uh, when you're finished there, you get what's called a polyadenylated mRNA precursor. So the, the poly A tail can add up to 200 A's on the tail, so it's just A, 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 A ad infinitum there towards the end of the tail. Okay, so the structure of eukaryotic mRNA 5' cap. So the sequence of modifications, you have uh, a 5' prime terminal nucleotide triphosphate, which is modified to remove a single phosphate, which is what you see up here. So 5' prime moved to a single phosphate. Okay. So then the diphosphate 5' prime end attacks the interior most phosphate GTP molecules to form a 5' prime to 5' prime linkage. Then the G base is methylated and the adjacent ribosome, riboses may also be methylated. So what you see there is the end here, the 5' prime cap of this, has been methylated in one and two and zero locations. You see here, here, just methylated in two, methylated in one, one and two, and this one is zero, one and two, which is the cap. So the biggest thing that this does is increase and enhances the mRNA stability. 
Okay, so now that we've sorted all that out, we need to explain what happens next. Let's go into the splicing, which we kind of covered earlier. Okay, so at specific regions, there's uh, a few players that are going to be taking, at specific regions for splicing, there are a few major players that you'll see involved. Uh, so in the, you'll have the primary RNA transcript, which is this. Uh, five SNRNPs, or SNRPs, small nuclear ribonuclear proteins, named U1, U2, U, uh, U4, U5, and U6. And then there's 50 or so accessory proteins as well. Okay, so the basic chemistry of splicing. Basically, oh, sorry. The, basically, the RNA has a 2' prime hydroxyl on every sugar. This uh, 2' prime hydroxyl attacks the phosphate at the 5' prime splice site. So it goes in here and attacks at the 5' prime splice site. This phosphorylates the 5' prime site and releases the AG, which you see here, so that the, uh, the newly released in there, the 3' prime OH there, can attack and phosphorylate the other uh, exon end um, at the lariat intermediates um, still remaining in there. So what that causes is it's a multi multi-step reactions. You have one, two, and then that causes, um, which results in the splice product and a lariat form of the intron. So you get this leftover bit in addition to the spl uh, newly splice product. Okay, so the structure of a splicing branch point. So at the branch point, which you see here, there's uh, transesterification, which is what we just saw here, so transesterification. Um, and then that branch point then it causes two sequential re reactions, which we talked about just a minute ago, and it's attacked right there. Okay, so when we talk about the SNRNPs, which we've mentioned a few times now, um, they are fairly important in regards to the splicing. So basically, if you're looking at it in terms of how the proteins interact with splicing, you have uh, what's called a branch point binding protein, which finds the branch site in the intron. Then uh, U1 and U2 uh, bind at the uh, G, uh, G end and the P end of the two exons with the intron in the middle. So that's U1 and U2 are bound. Then uh, the, additionally, the U4, 5, and 6 complex form um, to create what's called the spliceosome. Then you see the removal of uh, U1 and U4 both come off, and then uh, you have what is the, the first transesterification reaction, which if we go back in here and look, that would be what's happening here to here with the hydroxyl attacking the, the five prime splice site. So the first transesterification reaction occurs, and then uh, the, additionally the second transesterification reaction occurs over there which is obviously mediated there in the middle between the proteins. So then once those happens, the spliced exons are brought together through the phosphorylation there, and then the, you're left with a lariat intron as well, which goes off into the cytosol and is uh, reabsorbed and reprocessed. Okay, so final fun facts about splicing. So alternative splicing yields multiple proteins from one gene, which is an increase in genetic versatility. Um, however, errors or mutations in splicing and alternative splicing may cause 15% of all genetic disease. So, like you see here, it may code in one direction here, or it may code in an entirely different direction there. Um, in neural cells or thyroidal cells, and this sort of things can cause genetic disease and problems like that. Okay, um, and additionally, in some instances, RNA can sometimes splice itself well without the assistance of proteins. It can happen. Not saying that it does happen a lot, but it is something that is potentially possible with uh, with this sort of thing. Okay, and that about sums up RNA synthesis and splicing in as much as I have an understanding of. And we'll see you next time.